Our scripture this morning comes from John, the Gospel of John. And it's chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And it's the empty tomb. Early in the morning on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter And the other disciple left to go to the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and was the first to arrive at the tomb. Bending down to take a look, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. Following him, Simon Peter entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. He also saw the face cloth. That had been on Jesus' head and it wasn't with the other clothes but was folded up in its own place. Then the other disciple, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and he believed. They didn't yet understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. For the rest of scripture, let's all read together. The the words will be up on the screen. Mary stood outside near the tomb, crying. As she cried, she bent down to look into the tomb. She saw two angels dressed in white, seated where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and one at the foot. The angels asked her, Woman, why are you crying? And she replied, They have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. As soon as she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, Why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Ruboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Don't hold on to me, for I haven't yet gone up to my father. Go to my brothers and sisters and tell them, I'm going up to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Then she told them what she had said to her. So ends the reading of our word, the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I don't know if you've ever been to a fancy meal or um, something that's been really exclusive, maybe like a five-star restaurant. I worked at a job one time where we had to go to those dinners and, you know, it's always all the glasses and all the silverware and all the plates Karen and I, the, the most exclusive meal we ever were at was we, we went on our cruise to the Caribbean. And, you know, there's always that night of a cruise where you have to dress up formal night. And you go to the dining uh, room, and there it is. It's all spread out on your table. And it was like a 10-course meal. I mean, there's a glass for everything. There's a fork for everything, a knife, a, a plate for everything everything. You know, many of you will go home today and have an Easter dinner with friends and family. And what would you put on your table when you set it? Do you put the fine china 
that you have? Do you, do you go to the, the drawer that you keep the nice silverware, you know, the kind that you have to polish all the tarnish off first? Maybe you'll reach on the top shelf of your kitchen and grab the stemware that you probably haven't used for a very long time and place it on your table. How do you set your table? You know, I had a boss that when I worked at McDonald's, believe it or not, I worked, I was a manager for McDonald's for 10 years, part of my life. And we had a boss, his name was Mike France, and his wife, Julie, owned her home business. And she taught etiquette, proper etiquette to corporate executives. And I remember Mike gathered all the, the store managers of the McDonald's in the area. And we went over to their house and Julie taught us the prim and proper way how to eat a Big Mac, fries, and a drink using all the plates, the forks, the knives, and everything. She taught us the, the table manners. She told us what each plate was for. All the glasses, the water glasses, the wine glass, the, the dessert wine glass, and the fine silk tablecloth. And the fine linen neatly folded. And some are formed in origami, the, the napkin. You know, I read somewhere there's these hidden rules in society, you know, that, uh, uh, that we're all divided into social constructs called classes. And depending, there are certain things on each of these classes viewed differently. You know, if they were asked money, you know, how you view money. There's a class that would view money as money is to be spent. It's a tool. It's to, to buy things you want. There's another class that would say, no, money is to be managed. You know, pay all your bills and first and whatever's left over. Then you um, buy, you splurge. Yet there's another class that view money as something to be invested. When it comes to the food, these classes view them differently too. One class views that it's the quantity of food, the amount of food that you have, either to eat or even to survive. Some classes view food as the quality of food and where it's grown whether it's organic or uh, if pesticides have been used or whatever. So it's the quality of food. And then there's this third group that view food as the presentation, how it's presented on the table. You know, I was thinking about the different kinds of services that we have when we go to restaurants. And, you know, I've been to, how many people have been to a buffet? You know, you go to a buffet, you grab your plate and stuff, you go through the salad bar, you, you get your main course and everything, and then you go back to your table, right? And you, you eat your meal, and if you want any more, what do you do? You go and you get a new plate, and then you come back to your table, and what? The plate's gone, right? I mean, there used to be a, a buffet up in um, uh, St. Charles. And when I went to an uh, annual conference, it was a, 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 a chain of restaurants called Sweet Tomatoes. And they're no longer in existence, so we went bankrupt. But um, I used to love going there. You know, they had the best salad bar and everything. And I'd grab my plate and I'd go to my table. And one time in particular, I got to the table with my food. And I forgot to get a roll. You know, because I got to have my bread. So I got up, went, and got my roll, came back to the table. The, my plate was gone. And then I found out there were these little cards on the table that says, I'm not done yet, that you would place next to your table so the server knew not to take your table or uh, your plate when you were done. So, how do you set your table? How do we set our table? 
This past week's been Passion Week. Passion Week or Holy Week in the church. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday. We held our palms high and we weighed them and we said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Not hallelujah, we're glad he's here, but our hosannas, God save us. Save us from the oppression of the the Roman Empire. Help us, save us. And we had Holy Monday. It's where Jesus cleanses the temple. He, He goes into the temple and he turns over the tables of the money changers. See, at that time, to buy, you had to buy your sacrifice, and they only accepted temple money. So you took your Roman money to these money changers, and you exchanged them for the money that was accepted by your sacrifice. And there was corruption going on, so people would charge an exorbitant fee to exchange your money. So Jesus went and he disrupted, he turned the tables. And Holy Tuesday, on Tuesday, Jesus confronts the chief priests using their own words and twisted them in knots. Jesus used parables to the high priest. And then Wednesday was Spy Wednesday, where betrayal of the one among the disciples, Judas, is set in motion. Jesus told all of them that one would betray him. And then Monday, Thursday. Monday literally means new commandment. The Lord's Supper, the, the last meals of his disciples, at least in human form. And then Friday. Friday is Good Friday. I always wonder what's so good about Friday. About being arrested, persecuted, forced to carry your own cross through a jeering crowd, chanting, crucify him, crucify him. His death sentence. Now you remember after Jesus died, Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, Nicodemus, Perhaps the same Nicodemus, you know, Mary and Martha's brother that Jesus raised from the dead, brought spices of myrrh and perfume. Looking back on our Christmas, what did the Magi's bring at Jesus' birth? The gifts that they brought. But here, Nicodemus brought over 75 pounds of Perfume and myrrh and not quite half the weight of Jesus' body. And linen, linen that was cut into uh, strips, long, long strips. And they would dip these in the spices and myrrh and then they would wrap Jesus' body. And Joseph knew of a tomb. A tomb that no one had used before. And they laid Jesus' body on a stone bench, and they rolled a large stone to cover the entrance of that tomb. Pontius Pilate even placed a guard at the entrance of the tomb to guard against grave robbery. And then Saturday, Saturday this week, the vigil, the waiting, the wandering, The wondering, the the worry, the guilt, the fear. You know, when we think about Easter, you know, there's the Good Friday, and then we think about the Easter, and there's all this in-between time on Saturday. And if you're in the church life, you go, what are we supposed to do? That's the whole point. What do we do next? Then there was an earthquake. The guard was scared off and ran away. And when Mary Magdalene came in our reading, it was still dark. Very early in the morning, before dawn, before the first glimmer of light. If you look at the other Gospels, it's already light outside. 
but not in John's gospel. It was still dark. The very beginning of the day. The Jews at the time, the start of the day was not at dawn, but at sunset the night before. So think of Mary Magdalene being at the tomb at the earliest moment permissible under Sabbath rules. I mean, we can't help but think of John. And John's gospel talks about light and dark. The light and the darkness. And it's a prism through which the story of Jesus and his relationship to the world is presented. Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the light of the world. The light in which we all must abide. Yet in this passage, we have not light, but darkness that confronts us this Easter morning. The darkness is then followed by the dreaded realization that the tomb is empty. The gospel does not have Mary peering inward. She must assume that it's because the stone had been rolled away that the tomb is empty. The emptiness is not merely the absence of a body of her beloved Lord. Because in Judaism at the time, there was this belief that the spirit hovered over the body for three days before departing to the underworld. So Mary Magdalene is showing up at the earliest permissible time. And it was perhaps not only maintaining a, morf- a mournful vigilance over the body, but seeking one last moment of nearness to the departing spirit of her Lord. We now begin to comprehend the enormity of this moment, the lingering darkness, the emptiness of the tomb, and the sinking realization that the Lord has truly gone. In fact, so uh, unsuspecting was Mary Magdalene of what was soon to come that she assumed it was foul play, that somebody did take Jesus from the tomb, a grave robbery. See, today we celebrate Easter because we have the privilege of knowing how the story ends or how the story continues However long and dark tunnel we see, or at least we know that there is light at the end of that tunnel. But that was not the case for Jesus' disciples. For Mary Magdalene, the emptiness of the tomb was no invitation. It did not hint at a hope for resurrection. Rather, the darkness of that time of day was compounded by an emptiness and a deepening of her grief. See, for us now, as we closely look at this gospel of John, we should remember that the light of Easter begins in the empty darkness of the tomb. Our world can sometimes seem like a place where it is still dark. The world without seems one where the darkness is at, uh, as, a, as, as oppressive as ever. And there's also darkness within. Sin. Depression, suffering, maybe an enduring grief of a profound loss or that awful spiritual dryness that can strike the most devout of us believers. See, John has given Christians still experiencing their own dark nights of the soul a place to go. This is Easter season. And we can take our stand with Mary Magdalene in the darkness Staring into the emptiness of a tomb. I mean, it's striking that in this account, the light does not first come to Mary Magdalene. Her experience of darkness and emptiness is not somehow the only part of the story. In our scripture that we read earlier, Peter and the other disciple, we're not sure which one it was, ran to the tomb after Mary Magdalene told them what she had seen or not had seen. They ran together, one faster than the other, and the the one first to arrive at the tomb bent down to look in, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he didn't go in. And here comes Peter, second place, 
And he entered the tomb, and they both entered the tomb, and they saw the linen clothes lying there. And he also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head. And it wasn't with the other clothes, but it was neatly folded up in its own place. And then the other disciple, the one who arrived at the tomb first, also went inside. And they both saw and they believed, just as Jesus had told them. Peter enters and exits the tomb. The the disciple who had ran with him came. And what did they find? The burial linens lying over on the other side of the room. And the kerchief, the face cloth used to cover the head of Jesus was not lying with the other linen clothes, but separate, neatly folded, all by itself. I mean, the the burial clause, the linen comes from Levitical law. In Leviticus 16, it says, tell your brother Aaron that he cannot come whenever he wants into the holy area inside the inner curtain to the front of the cover that is on the chest or else he will die because I am present in the cloud above the cover. No, but Aaron must enter the holy area as follows, with a bull from the herd as a purification offering and a ram as an entirely burned offering. Aaron must dress in a holy linen tunic and wear linen undergarments on his body. He must tie a linen sash a small strip around himself and wrap a linen turban around his head. These are his holy clothes. Aaron's first to bathe his body in the water and then put them on. And after this, Aaron will enter the meeting tent, take the linen clothes he was wearing when he entered the inner holy area and will have them or and leave them there stripped naked. He will bathe his body in the water of the holy place and dress in his priestly clothing that he will go out and perform the entirely burned offerings for himself and for the people. In this way, he will make reconciliation for himself and for the people. He will completely burn the fat of the purification offering on the altar. See, for the burial, Joseph of Amarathea and Nicodemus wrapped Jesus' body in strips of linen and dipped them in the spices and myrrh. And when the disciples looked and Peter went into the tomb, they found those linens lying in pile removed. Was Jesus wearing his priestly clothing? And the napkin, the kerchief, The burial cloth, the face linen, the napkins and the linen cloths. You know, the napkin, a little bit about the napkin. I don't know how you use the napkin when you eat. Some people tuck it in like a bib, you know. So when you're eating, you don't spill anything on your shirt or your blouse. Some people fold it and put it in their lap. So in case any food falls off, it doesn't get on your pants or your dress. Some people don't use it at all. And then you have to get that stain remover and get the stain that's on your shirt or your pants. Right, Karen? How do you wear your napkin? You know, when you finish your meal, what do you do with it? You know, Jewish mannerism says when you finish with your meal, you wipe your face, you wipe your beard if you've got one, and you put your napkin down, covering what is left on your plate. It was a sign to the servant that the master had finished, and then they would clear the table. You know, there's been several books over the many years about 
the stations of the cross, all the events that happened during Holy Week, you know, the passion story. Friday night on the way over to St. John's for the Good Friday service, I, I went past uh, Holy Cross and they were doing a live reenactment of the passion story. They had the table set up, you know, for the last meal and all these people were dressed as Roman soldiers and there was a cross leaning up against the fence and I assume that was the cross that Jesus would carry to his crucifixion. There's been several books on the the last words that Jesus said when he's on the cross and it comes from this gospel of John because we believe that John was there. It saw the events with his own eyes. He was an eyewitness to what went on. Jesus' last words on the cross were, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A little bit later, Jesus, we read the words, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in between those last words, Jesus says, it is finished. Tetelestai in Greek, but tetelestai is, it is finished. Tetelestai is an accounting term. It means paid in full. See, when Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring that the debt of sin owed to his father was wiped away completely. Forever and for all time. Not that Jesus wiped away the debt that he had with his father, but the debt that we all have, all of mankind, each and every one of us, that the debt of sin had been paid. See, at the cross, it was finished. But Jesus, and the Easter message, the Easter message is, I am not finished yet. You see, Jesus sets the table. He sets the table. Because it's his table. All the events of Holy Week is all of Jesus' doing. It's the table he sets for each one of us. From our hosannas of God save us on Palm Sunday to our hallelujahs of today of God be praised. Jesus sets the table. And you know, we're all invited to this table. That table doesn't look big enough for all of us, does it? But what it represents is a table that we are all invited to. Each and every one of us. To his table. Because Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And you know how we know Christ is not done yet? 
Mary Magdalene and our story, she thought Jesus was the gardener, right? Out in the, the garden, outside the tomb, she thought it was the gardener at first. And we have that hymn, In the Garden. In the Garden was written by a, a former pharmacist, you know, a person who dispenses drugs. C. Austin Miles, in 1912, wrote that hymn, In the Garden. After he had died, his great-granddaughter said the song was written in a dark, dark, or a dark, cold, dreary, leaky basement in New Jersey that didn't even have a window to let the light in, let alone a view of a garden. Miles said before he died, it is as a writer of gospel songs, I am proud to be known, for in that way, I may be of most use to my master. Miles, in his lifetime, wrote 398 hymns, but it's in the garden that he is most known for. Come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen. See, as I said, this is Christ's table. The Lord's table. Because it's his. It's not ours. It's not mine. It's not Zion United Methodist Church. It's not the United Methodist denomination. It's not even the Christian table. It's the Lord's table. It's Holy Communion, the great thanksgiving, the Eucharist, the bread of life, the cup of salvation, a means of grace. And as Christ our Lord invites us all to this table, all that love him, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another, let us now share in a time of silent confession before God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. <coughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In ancient days, you created us in your image and you made us a reflection of your glory. And when we fell short, and the dim, the brilliance of your light within us, you held our hand as we journeyed from the garden into all the corners of the earth. And when we were afraid to look upon your glory, you came as a quiet traveler, as a burning bush, as a pillar of light, and you called us to be your people. You invited us to walk in your ways. And when we turned away, you continued to walk with us and you extended the hand of your steadfast love. In the words of a prophet, you offered your wisdom and your truth. And in the fullness of time, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to reveal your grace to the world. Even now, when we reject and we betray your ways, you call us to be resurrection people. Even when we are blind to the risen Christ, you walk with us, you teach us your ways. And on this journey of each Easter, we come to your table and we rejoice in your presence among us. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymns saying, Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven on earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is the salvation of grace, Jesus Christ. When you sent Christ into this earth, you walked with us as a brother and a friend, inviting us to hear your truth and to see your ways. Through Christ's patient love and unfailing grace and his victory over sin and death, you invite us into your presence. You rescue us from your sins and you lead on your path of righteousness. With Christ's call, in our lives, we are invited into your resurrection community to proclaim your glory and to reveal the truth of your presence in our world. With joy and gratitude, we will break this bread and remember the many times Jesus was revealed to his disciples. In the breaking of the bread, in the remembrance, we will take and eat this bread with awe and wonder. And we will fill this cup and we will remember the many times Jesus poured out his love and healing power abundantly and lovingly to those in need. In remembrance, we will drink from this cup and reflect on your overflowing grace in our lives. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of love and grace, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as your disciples, walking with the risen Christ, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I'll pour out your Holy Spirit on all that are gathered here, that we might be faithful disciples as we walk this roadway of life. And pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine that our hearts might burn within as we recognize your presence among us. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry of all the world until the resurrected one comes in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet through Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Today I'm going to offer to you, and you know at Planet Fitness, they got this area called the No Judgment Zone. We're going to break bread. And you're invited to take a piece of bread and, and dip it into the cup. It's called intinction. If you're not comfortable in doing so, we do have the prepackaged um, communion. And like I said, it's no judgment. It's just I've been praying about this all year, about Easter, to actually break the bread. Some pastors score it with a knife. I like breaking it because it's all uneven, like we are. And the cup, the cup of juice, the cup of salvation poured out for you, for many, the new covenant that's offered to each and every one of us. I need a couple of assistants to... Whitney, do you want to assist? Dan? I'll go ahead. Actually, if you want to... The cup of salvation and the bread. And we'll be... Let me move this back up here. Out of the way. We'll go uh, row by row, and if you, you know, either you can accept a piece of bread from me, dip it into the juice and consume it, or uh, take um, uh, one of the elements, uh, the prepackaged elements. So, Bev, if you could play something as we do this, and we'll kind of uh, go row by row. 
And if you don't feel comfortable coming up, raise your hand and we'll come to you um, to, to distribute the elements. Okay. Steve, the bread of life broken for you. Like I said, if you wanted to grab the elements or whatever, the bread of life broken for you. The bread of life broken for you. William, the bread of life broken for you. And you don't forget the bread of life broken for you. Oops. The bread of life broken for you. Oops. That you can do either one. The bread of life broken for you. The bread of life broken for you, Serafina. The bread of life broken for you. We, you can do the elements too. The bread of life broken for you. Do you want to do the prepackaged? Sure. The bread of life broken for you, Alyssa. The bread of life broken for you, Samara. Pat, the bread of life broken for you. Dwayne, the bread of life broken for you. The bread of, oops, unless you want that big piece. The bread of life broken for you. The bread of life broken for you. Nancy, the bread of life broken for you. Peyton, the bread of life broken for you. Nicole, the bread of life broken for you. Kelly, the bread of life broken for you. Chad, the bread of life broken for you. That's fine. That's fine. You want a bigger hunk? <laughs> the bread of life broken for you. John, the bread of life broken for you. Okay. Randy, the bread of life broken for you. Whoops. Bad. The bread of life broken for you. Gary, the bread of life broken for you. Oops. The bread of life, Shirlene, broken for you. Oops. Ken, the bread of life broken for you. The bread of life broken for you, Ruth. Okay. Hi. The bread of life broken for you. The bread of life broken for you. Okay. The, the bread of life broken for you. Hi, Sue. The bread of life broken for you. Bob, the bread of life broken for you. The bread of life broken for you. Everybody go through. Let's, um, did you want the bread or did you want the prepackaged? <coughs> okay, the bread of life broken for you. <coughs> and we can go up in here and we'll take it ourselves. <coughs> Dan, just keep holding the cup. Dan, the bread of uh, life broken for you. And Whitney, the bread of Christ broken for you. The bread of Christ broken for me. Or somebody can also say that. The bread of Christ broke for you, Pastor. Thanks be to God. Thank you.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this gift that you've given each one of us of Holy Communion. Let it nourish our bodies so we can go out into the world and spread your love amongst everyone. We ask this all now in your Son's most precious and redeeming name. Amen.